How's everyone doing today? Looking good. Raise your round of applause. We're back in person finally. Very exciting. Uh, raise your hand if you've been to an in-person Science 101 cafe. So a good chunk of us. So you waited patiently for two years and now you're back. So thanks for being here. My name is Max Saparis. I'm a meteorologist at Channel 27. That's the ABC station uh, here in town. I do the morning show. Uh, so I'll be running in for these events like right at eight because we still have some stuff to finish up uh, during Good Morning America. Uh, so we're proud sponsors of this event, WKOW, with Clean Lakes Alliance. I've done multiple events with them, with the Science Cafe and some of their uh, fundraisers. So it's been very fun to do. And I'm very excited again to be back here in person. And we do have some folks online as well. So welcome to you if you are watching virtually. And that's always going to be an option, it sounds like because why not? Um, so we know that the ice is off the lake. That's nice to see. It's melted now, I'm seeing some anglers out there. And just in time for the start of spring, or at least the mentality of it all, are those chairs, those colorful chairs coming back to the terrace. They're out there today. I mean, it's not the best weather for it, but there'll probably be some dry time if people want to get out there uh, before we get cool the rest of the week. Uh, so that's nice to hear, but of course, I want to go back to this morning's talk titled Lake Mendota, the good, the bad, and the present. So an interesting range of topics. It is said that Lake Mendota is one of the most studied lakes in the world, and it's been researched extensively since at least the 1880s. And today our speaker will be telling us about the large shifts in the lake's food web and the water quality that we've seen since those records were started uh, back in the late 1800s. The talk will also take a look at current research being done to better understand the lake and what the future might hold as well. And at the end of the talk, we'll come back to questions in person from our audience. And of course, if you are watching virtually as well, you can answer your questions and they'll be relayed to me. So we're going to get to everyone, hopefully that does have a question. Um, and we'll have that at the tail end of the presentation. Before we get to there, we want to uh, talk to Courtney Searle. She's from the Johnson Financial Group, uh, we'll, who will be here to introduce today's speaker. Courtney, welcome. Good morning, everyone. It's just a little intimidating to go after someone who presents on television for a living. I'm sitting in an office. Um, thanks, Mac. Along with First Weber, Johnson Financial Group is proud to be a presenting sponsor of these talks. I am also proud to work for an organization that is very passionate about investing in what matters, like protecting and improving one of Dane County's most precious assets, which is our lakes. Joining us sponsoring the Clean Lakes 101 is our usual hosting sponsor, of course, the Edgewater. It is so good to be back here in person, um, so good to see some familiar faces, and uh, also our supporting sponsor, National Guardian Life Insurance Company. Our production partners are the UW-Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies and the UW Extension. And as Max said, we are also happy to have WKOW as our media sponsor. Outside of the Science Cafes, Johnson Financial Group is also proud to sponsor a number of other Clean Lakes Alliance events, um, as well as participate in them, including the Loop the Lake, which is just two short months away. If you haven't signed up for this family-friendly bike ride yet, head over to cleanlakesalliance.org to register. All participants, this is maybe the best part, receive a free shirt courtesy of Land's End. And as always, kids 10 and under ride free with a paid adult. If you can't make it to the live event on June 18th at Oldberg Park, you can also participate virtually. We'll still send you a shirt. Back to today's talk, which is titled Lake Mendota, the good, the bad, and the present. Here to present today's topic is Ben Martin a PhD candidate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Ben works for the UW Center for Limnology, or I'm sorry, Ben works with the UW Center for Limnology Director Jake Vanderzanden on understanding food web ecology of lake ecosystems. He's been focused on understanding large scale food web shifts in many lakes, including our large lakes here in Madison. Please join me in welcoming Ben Martin. Uh, 
Hey, good morning, everybody. So I'm Ben Martin, PhD student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I work at the Center for Limnology. And today I'm going to give a talk um, titled Lake Mendota, The Good, The Bad, and The Present. Um, I do want to acknowledge my advisor there, Jake Banner Zandon. Um, some of you may have heard as he's given one of these talks um, rather recently. So just a little bit of background on me and what I study. I study um, food web disturbances. So as humans, we have done a lot of harm to lakes, and I want to study how what we do as humans impacts lake ecosystems. So things like climate change, invasive species, over-exploitation, pollution, habitat degradation. I want to understand at multiple levels, how do these impact individual fish? So how does it impact their behavior? How is climate change changing where the fish hang out in the lakes? And then I want to upscale that to population levels. I want to understand how do um, you know, all these disturbances impact uh, the, the fish at the population level and how are populations changing? And then really the granddaddy of them all is the, the community, the entire community of different fish species, but then it goes beyond just the fish in the lake and the surrounding area. So you have the, the herons and, and the reeds and all these other things that are, are on the, the lake edge and you don't think of as necessarily being part of the lake ecosystem, but really are. Um, and I want to encompass all of that and understand how particularly the main thing I focus on is these invasive species. Um, and Lake Mendota is a very um, popular lake and it has seen a lot of invasive species. So that will be at the forefront of a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. So a little bit of outline. Uh, I'm going to go through the watershed characteristics and development of Lake Mendota. Um, and then I'm going to cover different segments of time through um, um, Lake Mendota's history. So we're going to go European settlement to about the 1980s. And then we'll do the 1980s biomanipulation, um, which is pretty infamous for this lake. And then the onslaught of few invasive species go through kind of my own research and what, what I've uh, discovered through that. And then Lake Mendota's future, and I'll, I'll hopefully be able to give some insights as far as what that might look like. So I asked Southern Wisconsin, just picture what does Southern Wisconsin look like to you? It's important, if we're gonna understand Lake Mendota, we have to understand the watershed around it. If we picture Southern Wisconsin, this might be something you all are familiar with. You know, dairy, it's the dairy state, and these come with positives and negatives for lake ecosystems. Dairy is a very important thing to the state. It's an agricultural state. Economically, it's very important. Um, but there are a lot of nutrients that come from dairy cattle and dairy farming. Something else you'll see a lot in southern Wisconsin is going to be a lot of cropland. So a lot of corn, soybeans, all kinds of different crops. Again, very important for the economics of the state. Uh, but in southern Wisconsin, it's, it's a very normal thing to see. And we have repercussions of having such um, plentiful cropland. And again, I want to emphasize a lot of the cattle, um, just a lot of cattle, dairy farms. These are all things in the watershed that are present. Um, and we have to kind of deal with when understanding the history of Lake Mendota and what we've kind of seen. So now I want to walk you through kind of the history of the, the watershed itself uh, of Lake Mendota, but also just broadly Wisconsin, because it's a very similar story. So up here in the top, um, part A here, we see this is 1850. So this is pre kind of European settlement. And this is the land cover. So you'll see up here in the northern part of the state, you see a lot of these um, just general forests, uh, mostly um, coniferous forests, um, as well as some savanna. But here in the southern part of the state where Lake Mendota is, a lot of it's this deciduous savanna. It's a lot of prairie um, was kind of the original land use and land cover for the state. Um, and so this savanna you can picture as rain comes down, rain lands in a savanna, it takes a little while for all that water to move to Lake Mendota. It's all slowed down because it's, it's this grassland, there's a lot of you know, roots and a lot of complex vegetation that really holds, holds a lot of the water. You fast forward then to 1935, what you notice is all of this kind of light brown then turns to light yellow and that's cropland. And so we really transitioned Lake Mendota's watershed from being the savanna prairies to being cropland. And cropland being something we, we you know, you grow in the spring. Right now, there's not a whole lot um, growing on cropland. It's mostly dirt. And so when rain falls down, it very quickly brings um, all of the nutrients and all of the chemicals, everything that is associated with cropland, 
very quickly brings it all to Lake Mendota. And so you can really see that here that everything basically in the southern uh, third, two thirds of the state has been converted over to cropland. And then you fast forward to 1993, and again, a little bit more cropland creeps up into some of the northern um, part of the state, some of the Stevens Point area. Uh, but we also see right here in the, in the red is urbanization. And so urbanization, uh, you know, we build a lot of the um, parking lots and we make what are called impermeable surfaces. So the water really can move fast to Lake Mendota. Um, instead of, again, these old prairie lands where the water got absor absorbed by, by the prairie, um, we really transitioned it to a watershed that quickly moves everything that's on the land to Lake Mendota. And so this is what Lake Mendota's watershed looks like currently. And what a lot of people don't actually realize is Lake Mendota's watershed is mostly to the northern part of the lake. Um, here, we're here at the Edgewater. We're a tiny little sliver down here. Uh, we're barely in Lake Mendota's watershed, even though it's just right, out, right outside the door there. But a lot of the watershed is this um, area. I mean, even here's Cherokee Marsh, which I usually associate as being pretty far north of Lake Mendota, but really it, it extends all the way up into the forest and um, a lot of the area around there. And it's, it's mostly agriculture. Um, the watershed is over 50% agriculture at this point. Um, and that is really important to understanding the, the current issues we have in Lake Mendota and the water quality. And so agriculture is the main source of nutrients for Lake Mendota's um, nutrients. And so it's mostly the, the nitrogen and the phosphorus is mostly just running off from the croplands and is important to understanding a lot of the water quality issues we have at this point. So this is a very common site. This is uh, in the fall. So um, you have crops growing um, up in here, but all of this water is just bringing everything, um, the, the nutrients, the, the herbicides and everything into Lake Mendota very fast. Um, and so that is really important to understand that pre-European settlement, um, this was not that common. It was, it was much more prairies, it slowed down the water. And so this is important to understand as we move forward into Lake Mendota's watershed. And something else really important to note is how long it takes for water to turn over or flush through Lake Mendota. It takes about four and a half years for Lake Mendota to see an entire new um, set of water. So it, it's, it's a pretty long time for, if you're, if you're a, a raindrop and you enter Cherokee Marsh and you enter the top here, it may take you up to five years until you, you leave here at Tenney Park and go on to Monona um, and then hang out in Monona until you go to the next lake. Um, and so all of those nutrients that get run off into the lake are there for a while. And so that's really important as those nutrients are there and it takes a while for ecological processes to um, happen as all these nutrients are kind of stuck in the lake for quite a long time. So now we're going to move on to the food web. And this is really mostly what I, what I enjoy studying. Um, and the food web is uh, a little bit complex. I'm going to try to make it a little simpler for everybody. So at the base of the food web here, we have phytoplankton. So phytoplankton is the algae. It's the, it's the little green specks that are in the water. It decreases our, our water clarity, um, but really they're the base of the food web and are very important for the lake as they provide all of the energy for higher trophic um, levels, bigger, bigger things in the, in the food web. Then we have the zooplankton. Zooplankton are really important. Zooplankton are what eat the algae. I equivalent them to kind of our, our aquatic cows. They, they, they're out there, they just graze all of this um, algae. And so we care a lot about uh, healthy, healthy zooplankton populations in order to graze the algae. And then we have what eats the algae. We have the planktivores, we have the yellow perch, as well as Cisco, Lake Mendota Cisco have kind of come and gone. Um, but all of these fish, uh, what they primarily feed on are the zooplankton. And so they're important fish in the food web and are kind of this third tier of the food web. And finally, we have the, the, what most of us think about uh, in lakes are kind of the, the plankton or the, the uh, piscivores. So the walleye, the pike, everything everyone wants to catch and eat on Friday night with a fish fry. All of those fish, they're at the top there and they're eating uh, the, the yellow perch and the cisco, they eat our zooplankton and the zooplankton eat the algae. And so it's all this kind of just cascading interactions in our food web um, is how Lake Mendota kind of sets up. So now we'll get into kind of some of the history of Lake Mendota's food web. Lake Mendota pre-1987, this was kind of the common site you might see on Lake Mendota. Um, you see a lot of people ice fishing, and mostly what they were ice fishing for was yellow perch. 
Um, many of you have probably driven past uh, Monona Bay and you see all the ice fishermen out there. It was actually kind of the inverse. All of those anglers were out on Lake Mendota in that 50s and 60s era because yellow perch were really, really popular and doing well. Um, so well that um, this is a photo from uh, just off Tenney Park. And this angler, it took them less than 90 minutes to catch their entire limit of yellow perch. I um, mean, pretty good size yellow perch. Um, and so that was 25 fish. And so the perch population was doing really, really well. And that was more or less the natural state of the lake was this really good yellow perch fishery. And in order to have that, we kind of didn't have as much northern pike and walleye. It was, it was really a yellow perch fishery. And so that was kind of the, the state of the lake in the 1980s. And so in order to summarize that, what, we, what it looks like is we have very few of these pisivores, these uh, pike and walleye. We had a lot of these zooplanktivorous fish, and therefore we had fewer of these zooplankton that are eating the algae, and therefore we had a bit of greener water um, in that time. And so that was kind of the state of the lake uh, from European settlement until the 1980s. Now the 1980s came around and people were starting to ask the question, how can we leverage food webs in order to increase water clarity. And they started just looking at this very basic food web diagram and started thinking, you know, if we increase the piscivores, if we put more northern pike and walleye into the lakes, then that is likely to cause a decrease in the planktivores, the cisco and the yellow perch. And that would then increase zooplankton and that would therefore decrease phytoplankton. So it's all this domino effect that's going on and so this was kind of the base of, a th of, of the, the trophic cascade theory in the 1980s. And so this led to a rather uh, famous experiment going on up, uh, on, the year, uh, up on the UP um, with Steve Carpenter, as many of you have probably heard of. Um, so this was kind of his grad work. And so he did a, a very intricate experiment um, where so these, this was one lake at one point, they, they built a, a barrier between the two lakes and in this uh, top lake, what they did was they stocked a bunch of piscivores. They put a bunch of largemouth bass into the lake and made it dominated by largemouth bass. So this top-down apex predator was the dominant species in the lake. And then down here in the bottom lake, they made it a zooplanktivorous uh, a lake. So they had a lot of just mostly bluegill, um, very few largemouth bass. And so the lake was dominated by all of these planktivorous fish, these fish that are eating the zooplankton and I don't need to show you any plots here because you can see the bottom lake is a lot more green and the top lake is much more clear. And so these experiments in the 1980s really showed that you can manipulate the food web in a way that can maximize water clarity or have this kind of turbid state. And it's just, what do you want out of your lake? You can have different situations um, based on these food web alterations. And so then researchers in the 80s were looking at Lake Mendota. Um, they may have been sitting there on the terrace and were looking out and thought, you know, the lake's pretty green. Um, what if we could change that? And so we went back to the food web diagram. We thought, well, if we could do it in a small lake up in the UP, what if we did it in Lake Mendota, which is a rather large lake? And so I thought, you know, if we increase the piscivores, the pike, the walleye, we may decrease the planktivores, the yellow perch, increase the zooplankton, Daphnia being the main species, and then minimize phytoplankton. And that was what they did. And so in the 1980s through the uh, 2000s and still today, we've stocked a lot of walleye and pike into the lake, hundreds of thousands into the lake in order to try and leverage the food web to increase water clarity the best we can. And it was successful. Um, we increased water clarity by about a meter or three feet. And it was, it was just very successful. It turns out that it, it worked and things were all good. Um, and to summarize here, here was kind of that initial food web prior to the biomanipulation. We had you know, less clear water, not that many zooplankton, a lot of these zooplanktivorous fishes and not that many pike. Really, we just inversed the food web by stocking all of these pike and walleye. And so you see here, just a lot of pike and walleye very few perch and white bass, and then a ton of zooplankton and good clear water. And we all were sitting happy at the terrace, enjoying a beer, coffee, and there was, there was nice water clarity. Um, the, the experiment had worked. And this all happened until the invasion of spiny water flea. And spiny water flea is the species that I mostly study here uh, over the last four years. And so I'll be able to 
um, tell you a little bit about what the invasion has done and the outlook for them. So spiny water flea are these invasive zooplankton. And often the question I get is, when did they get here? And what we can use is sediment cores. So we, we take a, a, a pipe basically and we push it down through the sediment. Um, the tails of the spiny water flea are not digestible by any kind of organisms in the lake. And so those tails end up um, layered in the lake. And so we're able to tell when, how long ago have we seen spiny water flea in the lakes. And what we actually found was uh, they've been here since about the 80s, um, even though they only came about in 2009. And the reason that they came about in 2009 was 2008 was a very cool summer. Um, I was not in Madison for that summer, so I don't really know, but um, 2008 was apparently very cool. And spiny water flea are cold water species. So the eggs that are on their, their brood pouch on the back of them, they die if the water gets too warm. And so 2008 was very cool. That entire layer of eggs didn't die off. And so 2009, all of these things hatched and we saw just an absolute explosion of spiny water flea in 2009. And invasive species are, are very interesting in the way that they establish in lakes. Um, it actually takes a lot for an invasive species to be successful. First off, you have to be introduced to the lake. So the, the spiny water flea had to be dropped in at some point, whether it was on a boat or someone's anchor or something like that. They have to first you know, be introduced or colonize the lake, but that does not mean that they will be successful in the lake. Next, they have to actually establish. So they have to reproduce and, and build a population. Fortunately for spiny water flea, they don't need um, to mate with any another individual. They're asexual. And so they're kind of the perfect invasive species that only takes a single egg dropping into a lake for them to be successful. But then even just establishing is not enough. To be an actual invasive species, you have to have impact. Um, so you see here the smallmouth bass kind of jousting with, with a native fish here on the plot. Uh, they have to have an impact. They have to actually displace other species, the native species, and impact um, the, their ecological place um, in the lake. And then finally, if all of that works out, then, then we say that that lake is vulnerable to an invasion. And so in the case of spiny water flea, they were hanging around. They've been here for several decades. Um, but that big spike in 2009 established them as having um, a lot of impacts on the lake. So. These are spiny water flea here. They get their names from these little spines on their tail. Um, they are rather large um, for a zooplankton. Um, a lot of times zooplankton tend to be uh, much smaller than these guys here. So these guys, you can probably see them um, pretty easily. Um, they're about the size of the width of your pinky, uh, which is a lot larger than most zooplankton. And so that leads them, they're, they're much faster than our native zooplankton and they love eating our native zooplankton. So all of the zooplankton we were building up and trying to make sure that they were doing really, really well in the lake, they, Spiny Water Fleet basically came in and just wreaked havoc on them and just decimated our, our native zooplankton population. We saw basically a 90% decline in our native zooplankton. Lake Minota actually is the home to the largest Spiny Water Fleet population in the world. Um, it is absolutely insane. If you take a flashlight, they're actually attracted to light. Um, in the fall, when they're at their top abundances, if you swirled in a circle, they'll actually create water currents. Um, there's that many spiny water flea in Lake Mendota. And so the impacts that they had were they, we lost three feet of water clarity. Um, thinking back to those nutrients that we talked about that are a lot of the issue, um, if we wanted to reduce the nutrients in the northern part of the watershed, it was estimated it would cost about $160 million a year to basically reduce all of those nutrients. And so that was a previous grad student, Jake Walsh, that was in the lab. His work basically came out with that and that was not practical. Um, we're not gonna get our water clarity back with paying $160 million a year. Um, we saw this major decline in the native Daphnia, um, these big, fat, slow moving uh, kind of zooplankton that were eating up all the algae. Spiny water flea just absolutely killed them off. And basically it reversed all of the benefits we saw from the 1987 to present day, that biomanipulation basically set up the food web that we had so much Daphnia that this was the perfect lake for like for spiny water flea to get into. They had this massive food resource. They had very little predators. And so that's kind of why we now have the largest population of spiny water flea. And I mean, it's, it's kind of gross, just the number of spiny water flea you can see. Um, a lot of anglers, if you're out there kind of trolling or driving around with your, your lures out the back of your boat, um, they'll build up in your fishing line and you'll see them kind of twitching about on the line. 
Um, but yeah, there's just really a lot of them in the lake. And so my research question when I got here was, can fish predation mitigate the invasion? So we knew that we weren't gonna be able to reduce the nutrients that are coming to the lake. That was gonna to be too costly. But if we did a biomanipulation in the 80s that benefited water clarity, could we do a biomanipulation 2.0 in order to mitigate the invasion? Um, and obviously I'm not ready to just do that. I was doing the research of what could the potential scenarios be? And so the big question was, can we increase the population of fish that are eating spiny water flea in order to minimize their impacts? And to answer that question, it took a lot of, a lot of work. I'm a PhD student for four years now. Um, we had to go out there all kinds of hours at midnight, one in the morning, um, electroshocking fish and getting all these samples. We collected everything, so the zooplankton, the bugs, the fish, and we needed to understand how the food web currently is situated. Um, in order to better understand what the invasion is doing and how we might be able to leverage the food web. And so when you're out there um, every week, you get to see all kinds of different conditions of the lake. So this is uh, May of 2019. You can see there it's rather dark. Um, all of that dark color is our native zooplankton. That's the Daphnia. And so if you're looking for the best clear water in Lake Mendota, it's going to be here in a, about a month. Um, you'll go out there. That is going to be the clearest water. Uh, you can probably see out the front here, it's, it's pretty clear, but then this is kind of July and August. That's the green soup that we all know. Um, and so the lake goes through these different fluctuations and I wanna understand how the food web changes during these different times. And so my approach really was to just go out there and collect as many organisms as I possibly can in order to better understand the food web. So I was out there collecting the bugs, the zooplankton, all kinds of different fish. And what I do is I analyze stable isotopes. So stable isotopes of carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 are reflective of what you eat. So when you eat something, so this zooplankton eats the phytoplankton, they increase in an increment that we know um, through different research um, in the carbon and the nitrogen, they increase in a way that we know um, how much they would have increased if they ate the phytoplankton. And so every month, basically, I was collecting everything in the lake, as many bugs, zooplankton. And I was getting these snapshots that just told me what the food web was looking like. And so for an entire year, I just tried to understand how does the food web shift throughout the, throughout the different months and understand who's eating who. And really, the big, the big kicker here is, is looking in fish diets and understanding who's eating spiny water flea. Who's eating spiny water flea when spiny water flea aren't at a high abundance? Um, who's eating them, you know, just how many are they eating and just trying to figure out who is the best kind of hitman for spiny water flea. What they didn't realize was their stomach contents are kind of the resume to be, to be our hit guy. Um, and so really it was just pretty plain, just looking through a lot of fish diets, trying to see who's eating spiny water flea and who's eating them the most. And that's probably the question I get asked the most is what fish actually eat these things. Name spiny water flea sounds like something no one would want to eat. But as it turns out, these guys here, the yellow perch, eat them a lot. Um, they eat them. If I can find a yellow perch in a lake with spiny water flea, they're in their stomachs uh, more often than not. And so yellow perch seem to really like them. They'll eat them um, even when they're small. Even when the yellow perch is rather large, they'll still eat spiny water flea. Um, spiny water flea get eaten by yellow perch even when spiny water flea at a very low abundance. And so this seems like a pretty important player in the story. But there's also a number of other fish and fish that you wouldn't really think of as eating spiny water flea, this, this zooplankton that's not that big. Um, Largemouth bass and smallmouth bass will actually eat it, but it's only when those game fish are really small. Um, when they're really small and there's not a ton of other food, you'll see these other bigger game fish eating them. But in reality, the answer is not just stocking a bunch of largemouth bass because as soon as they get a foot long, they're eating yellow perch. So um, it kind of points our finger at, we know kind of the fish that's um, of interest for this invasion. And when I say they're eating them, this picture kind of grainy here, but all these kind of straight lines are tails of spiny water flea. When I look in a perch's stomach, you'll see thousands of these um, tails in their stomachs. And that kind of brings um, question to me that I was like, I thought fish didn't eat these, everything I've read. And I really wanted to actually watch them eat them in order to better understand the impacts spiny water flea are having on fish communities. And so I tried to do these uh, feeding trials and so I built all these tanks. What I, one thing I did learn is I'm a very bad plumber. Um, <laughs> all of these things leaked terribly. Um, the university was not happy with me. <laughs> um, 
but it, it worked out. I, I got the experiments done, but I don't think I'll do much more of this type of experiments <laughs> leading forward. And what I found was when I, when I first put those first spiny water flea into a tank with a small fish, it was pretty anticlimactic. The fish just ate them. It was that simple. They, they didn't struggle. I had read that they'll cough them up and all these different things. And these small fish just ate them. And that was uh, a little, I don't know, I don't want to say it was disappointing, but I expected a lot more. And so I was able to confirm that fish that I get from Lake Mendota seem to be eating them. I'm finding them in their stomachs, a lot of, a lot, hundreds to thousands of them in their stomachs. And then in this lab experiment, I, experiment, I found that uh, they eat them pretty re regularly and it's nothing too crazy. And so I do have a video here of uh, a very small yellow perch about uh, a few inches and it's kind of dark, but you can see, I mean, he's just chomping on these things. Um, he really didn't struggle. He's kind of just sitting there now, just like, is there more? Um, there is one down here in the bottom left. So he just chomps on that and there's gonna be another one up the surface. Um, but really what I found was that they don't really struggle to eat these things. They, they, they don't have a lot of issue with it. And so a question there I get from that is, is it harmful for the fish to eat these things? That's a very important question if we're thinking about mitigating this. And something I've done is looked at body condition. So body condition is your weight relative to your length. So I look at, are the, the perch in the lake getting fatter or skinnier since the invasion? Unfortunately, we have a lot of data from Lake Mendota. And what I found is very small uh, perch and other zooplanktivores have gotten a little bit skinnier. And that's during that time period that they can't yet eat spiny water flea. They're actually directly competing with them for food resources. And so they've gotten a little bit skinnier, but once you're, you know, a big perch like this, that again, we all want to eat on Friday night at a fish fry. Once you're at that size, you've got a plentiful resource out there to eat. And so the big yellow perch have gotten fatter since um, the invasion. Um, and so we do know that it doesn't seem that harmful for um, fish to eat them. Um, and so that's been encouraging. And so you ask the question, is this biomanipulation round two? Well, fortunately, I don't have to make that decision. I just get to do the research and bring it to the resource managers that get to make decisions on as far as what do we do next. And so what we found is we know which species are eating spiny water flea. And if we wanted to leverage that, we, we know who, who to talk to. It's, it's the yellow perch. The newly manipulated food web would look rather different. Currently, the lake is a, a large uh, you know, pike and walleye fishery. Um, it does very well for that, that drives economy. Um, but then we saw the water clarity issue. And so it's a very classic resource management question of what do we want to prioritize? What do we value most? And I, I have no opinion on, on what, what, what that is. Um, I can just tell you what is eating spiny water flea. Um, and therefore, you know, there's different scenarios for the lake and um, resource managers moving forward will be able to decide what is valued most. Now, there is the other invasive species that many of you are probably like, is he going to talk about this or not? So zebra mussels. Zebra mussels got here in 2015. And zebra mussels are a severe threat to a lot of our native uh, mussels and uh, biodiversity. They're also, uh, as far as infrastructure, very, very problematic because they attach to pipes and docks and they degrade them. And so this is another invasive species that is having that has caused problems in the lake. And so what are the impacts of these zebra mussels? Number one is they're a very, very efficient graze, uh, filter feeder. So they're filtering out the algae mostly. It turns out that they're selective feeders and they don't like eating the blue-green algae. Many of you know the blue-green algae are problematic. They're, they cause our beach closures. Um, if dogs drink the water, it may kill them. And so they've caused more water quality issues. And it's because they, they, they are not eating the blue-green algae. So the blue-green algae get to dominate the lake ecosystem. From an ecological and food web standpoint, they're pulling a lot of that energy down to the base of the food web. So there's all of that algae that's kind of swimming around and just hanging out in the middle of the water column. Those zebra mussels at the bottom are filtering all of that energy out the base of the food web. And to put it bluntly, they're kind of defecating at the bottom of the lake. And all of the bugs that are at the bottom of the lake now are getting access to more um, resources, more energy. And so the big impact they've had is that the insects that live on the bottom of the lake have increased in abundance a lot. So a lot of the midges, um, all these different, you know, caddis flies and uh, dobson flies, all these little bugs at the bottom of the lake are doing really, really good. Um, but kind of the fish that want to eat the zooplankton and the zooplankton rely on the algae, 
they're kind of left out because all of that algae is getting sucked down to the bottom of the lake. And so it's, it's not a great scenario for the zooplankton and those zooplanktivorous pathways in the lake ecosystem. So often I get asked, what is the current state of zebra mussels in Lake Mendota? Well, as it turns out, Lake Mendota is mostly muck and zebra mussels need a hard surface to attach to. And so fortunately for us, there's not that much hard surfaces in Lake Mendota. And so very quickly they reached their maximum abundance um, in Lake Mendota. So at this point, what you see out there is what you get. They cannot, unless we pave the bottom of Lake Mendota, it's pretty much as many, as many zebra mussels as we're possibly ever gonna get. Um, and so the impacts at this point, we pretty well understand and we don't expect there to be any kind of changes in the zebra mussel story. So now onto the Lake Mendota's future. And so I'm wrapping up here. Um, there's a couple of things that are probably given. Species invasions are a common thing that has been um, you know, shown through this talk. We expect there to still be more species invasion. So this chart here shows the almost 200 uh, invasive species that are in the Great Lakes um, since we built the St. Lawrence Seaway into the Great Lakes. Any one of these could be the next invader in Lake Mendota. Um, often I'm asked, you know, where does spiny water flea come from? Where did the zebra mussels come from? And yes, they're native to um, Europe, but really we didn't get a single spiny water flea from Europe. It most likely came from the Great Lakes. So you take your boat out to the Great Lakes, you bring it back to Lake Mendota, and you bring those other fauna back to the lake. And so any number of these are more than likely the next thing we may hear about. Um, so you come to this talk 10 years from now, there will probably be one of these that you'll hear about. Um, but so that's probably a given. Lake Mendota is just very uh, populated lake. There's a lot of people around, there's a lot of boat traffic. And so species invasions are probably nothing um, new that you're gonna continue to probably hear about in Lake Mendota. And second is gonna be the, the algal blooms and the water quality issues. You know, we, if we think back to the beginning of the talk here and we think about all of the, the agriculture that goes on in the lake, that's probably not going anywhere. And it's obviously economically driven and it's very important to our state. It's going to stay. And so those issues are probably still going to plague us as we just get a lot of nutrients coming into Lake Mendota and we don't see any um, change um, in the future. So if the landscape continues to look like this, we don't expect Lake Mendota's water quality to change um, because this is at the core, a lot of where our, all of our nutrients are coming from um, and are important to understanding the reality of what Lake Mendota's future looks like. And with that, I'll wrap things up by some acknowledgements, funding from the Center for Homology, the Northern Temperate Lakes LTER, and the Wisconsin DNR. I've had a number of great research assistants, been very rewarding, um, advising undergrads and introducing them to research. Um, and we've been able to uh, discover some interesting things, I hope. Um, and so down there at the bottom, I do have my contact info. Feel free to email if you have any questions. Um, also have a Twitter account, uh, <laughs> Tiny the Spiny. Um, it's just a uh, Spiny Water Flea Twitter account that um, follows just Spiny Water Flea research. And with that, I think I'll take any questions. Round of applause for Ben Martin here. That's great. So we'll keep you up here okay. and then we'll take questions down here. And of course, virtually as well. Uh, we might hear from Adam who is monitoring that. So any questions uh, for Mr. Martin, soon to be Dr. Martin, sounds like. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I mean, after all that research, you'd imagine he'd have to get it. So any questions? Right to Adam then for a virtual question first. Okay, here's the first uh, virtual question. Uh, good one. Uh, can fish excrete the spiny water flea tails or do the tails accumulate in the stomach indefinitely, which seems like it could have health effects? Very good question. And that's a research question I asked. So when I did those feeding trials, I um, actually did timed feeding. So I fed fish a bulk of um, spiny water flea and then timed them in order to measure uh, the rate of uh, excretion of the spiny water flea. And so I waited 12 hours, 16 hours, 20 hours, 24 hours, um, and then looked in the fish in order to see where did the spines get to. And what I found was the excretion rate was the same as other food um, items. And so they were moving about, it moves, takes about 24 hours for a fish to excrete um, the food that they eat. And so I was able to confirm that it doesn't clog their stomachs or anything. Um, but that is a very important question. It's something I was very concerned about initially, but it does seem they move through the, the, the intestines rather, rather fast in the same uh, pace as any other food resource. All right. 
question in person. Here we go. So to impact the uh, uh, the water clarity, now you can't make a value judgment on that, but if our value judgment is clearer water and cleaner water, how low would the maximum length of a, of a wall I have to be and a northern pike? Because right now it's 40 inches for a northern and 18 for a walleye. Yeah, and I'm not really sure about that. That's a really good question is, and something that, you know, more fisheries uh, scientists will have to figure out if, if they decide to have any management actions um, to introduce more perch. Um, and so some of that would be, you know, we need to know what size walleye, um, as far as the gape, when can they start eating the perch that are really chowing down on a lot of these spiny water flea. Um, and there are um, some models for that, but that's definitely a, a step moving forward that we have to better understand, you know, how can we set up that fishery, especially as far as sport fishing goes and how that interaction plays in. Obviously, the, the lake food web um, story here, I've kind of left out anglers, but the anglers have an impact and shape how the food web looks. Um, and that is something that will have to be put into play as far as understanding. I'm so sorry, I don't have a great answer for that. <laughs> Have you been able to figure out how many fish would be needed in Lake Mendota to make the change? That's number one. And the second question is, have you presented this to the DNR fisheries? And what was the response if you did? Yeah, so as far as the, the, the X number of fish we need, um, have not exactly figured that, that number out. Um, again, it's more of uh, from that initial plot from the, our initial, uh, a photo from up in northern Wisconsin, up in the UP, there's these different kind of regimes that lakes can set up as, as this clear water regime or these uh, more turbid water regimes. And so we kind of know as far as uh, the, the way the food web has to set up in order to um, have those impacts. And yes, lots of talks with the DNR. Um, they fund all of this. The DNR has been great. We communicate um, very frequently. And a lot of these slides came from the last talk I had to give with them. Um, and so, yes, we're in great, great communication with them. And at the end of the day, they're the resource managers. Um, there's these different scenarios that'll play out. And fortunately it's in their hands to decide everything and I don't have to do that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're very well aware of this. And I would say it's still just up in the air of just understanding what do we want out of the lake. Clear water's one, one thing. There's the law in the pike fishery, which is very economically um, great. And there's just all these different scenarios that you kind of have to weigh in on. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a little bit complicated. What is the status of the perch fishery currently? Is it robust enough to, to be able to control the spiny water flea or does, is there room for improvement there? Yeah. So the way the food web, since the biomanipulation was set up, the biomanipulation stocked a lot of pike and walleye. And so those are fish that are eating the yellow perch. And so there, there are still plenty of yellow perch out there. People catch them all the time, um, but it's not what it was in the 50s and 60s before the biomanipulation. Um, and so the population could be a lot more. Um, so right now the population is, is not, not high. Um, and in order, if, if we decided we wanted to mitigate the spiny water flea, we would want to try and increase the, the yellow perch as much as we can. And currently it is, uh, it does have improvement if you wanted to do that. If you increase the perch, wouldn't, why won't the walleye and the pike also increase because they have more food? Yeah, so that's a good question. And so it's all these uh, cascading or domino effects. So if we stock a lot, a lot of perch and we don't continue to stock the walleye and the pike, um, the wall and the pike, they will decline in population and will then bolster the yellow perch don't as many predators. And so they'll, they'll have the upper hand at the lake. Um, and so it, it does take time um, and you have to really hit it hard with a heavy hammer to really make sure that the perch can take off. Um, and so that's kind of my best um, answer I can give, but it, it takes time is, is kind of what I've skipped over a lot of this. It really does take time for um, those transitions to take place. of that. Um, I understand that musky can't breed naturally in the lake. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so musky are a river, a river fish. Um, so if you go over to the dam over by Wingra, you'll see all the muskies trying to jump the dam. Um, naturally, they want to get upstream to spawn. Um, and since they're in a lake, they're kind of stuck there. So they, they can't naturally reproduce. 
Yeah, I live right there. So I've been watching them. It's super cool. So I, now this week I've noticed in uh, Winger Creek that there's just thousands and thousands of tiny, tiny bluegill and tiny bass like everywhere in, in there. So I was wondering what the timing is with that because um, I haven't seen that in the last year since I've lived right there. Yeah, so that kind of goes back to what we call lake phenology. So the lakes kind of all naturally through evolutionary processes um, have these different timings of everything. And so the reason we have really clear water in the beginning part right now is because there's a lot of Daphnia. The reason we have a lot of bluegill that are coming around right now is because they eat the Daphnia. So everything's kind of evolved to be all timing with each other. So right now, yeah, you're gonna see there's a lot of zooplankton out there and a lot of the small fish are getting active um, and are really trying to pack on the pounds um, with all of the, the food that's been finally available after they kind of starved through winter um, and their metabolisms were very slow. So yeah, right now is a, a very, um, very popular time. There's a lot, of, a lot of action going on, even though it's still kind of 40 degrees out. Max, we have an online question. Uh, two people have uh, sort of asked the same thing um, uh, for you, Ben. Uh, are swimmers affected by the spines or spiny water fleas in general? Can they be problematic to people who are swimming in the lake? Uh, no, not really. Um, they're a little soft. I mean, I have them here, so anyone can check them out. Um, they're, they're not that pointy to us as humans. Um, I have had an undergrad that actually ate one, um, just on a dare. Um, so they're, they're, they're not, they're not that harmful to us. We're a lot bigger than the spiny water flea. So, um, no, no, they don't really harm us. You talked about. Oh, uh, you talked about agricultural runoff. Uh, urban runoff is an important factor, and the urban trend is trying to get stormwater as quickly as possible into the lake. And the velocity coming down is disturbing a lot of the sediment at the bottom of the lake, which has phosphorus in it and other things. Are you seeing that becoming a problem or? Yeah, so that's not something I directly work on, but it's a very good point. So these, these stormwater drains come in, um, a lot of, like I said, it takes about five years for all those nutrients and all the water to actually turn over in Lake Mendota. We don't go through all the nutrients in five years. So those, those nutrients lay down at the bottom of the lake. We call them legacy nutrients. They're at the bottom. And when those stormwater um, runoff and comes out of a pipe, it disturbs the lake bottom where all these have settled and it causes um, this legacy nutrient to come into the uh, water column and be uh, bio, biologically available. Um, and so it's not something I'm directly working on, but yes, the urban... Um, stormwater is, is a big, big issue. Um, a lot of the salts, as many of you have probably heard from also people at the Center for Knowledge, the salts are a big issue um, and just a number of other chemicals. It's all, all of these things that are out there on the landscape are coming in. And yeah, that churning of the, the lake bottom is, is, is problematic. Um, and people are working on that and hopefully can give a talk some, some other day on that. <laughs> Max, we have another, oh. Hello. We have a couple more online questions here. Here's another interesting one. Um, what are the similarities and differences with this situation that we talked about today in Lake Mendota in the other Madison lakes? Yeah, so the, the Madison lakes themselves are, the food webs are rather different. So Lake Mendota is kind of the, the Pisivore Lake, the, the walleye, the muskie, um, the, the pike. Mendona, as you can see all the anglers over there, it's much more of a bluegill, bluegill fishery, um, uh, some perch, but it's largely that, that third tier, that, that those fish that are eating the zooplankton. So that lake is much more um, that style of a fishery. There's not as much of the piscivores um, in that lake. And so it actually sets up rather well for um, people to come and fish the city is, is if you want to go catch a bunch of walleye and pike, you can go to Lake Mendota. And the next day you can go to Lake Mendota and catch other fish species. And so economically, that's a, a really good resource to have that kind of um, different fishery set up. Um, spiny water flea are in all of the other lakes in, in the Madison chain, um, but they don't reach the same abundances that they do in Mendota. And that goes back to that biomanipulation really emphasized the most number of Daphnia we could possibly have, just a massive zooplankton population. And spiny water flea got into Mendota and it was the most food, food that they could possibly have and very few predators. And so the situation in Mendota is very different than the rest of the Madison lakes or the dozen lakes that also have spiny water flea in Wisconsin. In particular, those lakes are in the northern part of the state um, up in the Manaqua area. And the, the invasions have played out very different there because the food webs are just very different um, at the base level.
Um, I'm wondering whether with uh, climate change we'll get warming in Lake Mendota that would discourage the spiny water flea. Very good question and something a prior researcher has asked. And so they have done uh, climate modeling of the species and depending on what climate model you use, uh, it is expected that spiny water flea maybe will not be able to tolerate Lake Mendota's conditions by 2060. But we're still not sure when you slowly change the temperature um, and a species is still there, they can evolve to make, make do with the conditions. And so we're not able to predict how hot can it be for spiny water flea to still live. If we made it 2060 today, they'd probably die off. But as it's going to be this kind of slow increase in temperature, we cannot be sure as far as what that may look like. But we do anticipate that we may lose some cold water species. Here's another online question. Stick with me. There's a couple of <laughs> ifs ends here. So if we return to a yellow perch dominated fishery, do you expect that the algae levels would be similar to those observed under early perch dominated conditions? Example, still relatively green, but spinies being replaced by more native zooplankton. Since the yellow perch eat the Daphne, a two, would it actually be a gain for water clarity? Yeah, so that's part of the complexity of this issue. <laughs> is we predict that the, the, the yellow perch, spiny water flea are a big food resource. So they're bigger than the Daphnia. Um, calorie wise, it's a, a food that they would prefer to eat because it's a bigger meal. And so we anticipate that they would preferentially consume the spiny water flea rather than the Daphnia. Um, but yes, if we drove down the spiny water flea so much, yeah, they're gonna turn on the Daphnia. Um, and so it's complex. Um, we would expect the water clarity to probably be more similar to that early time period, but um, that's still something we're still just trying to figure out and um, understanding with, with the DNR and the other resource managers. Is there a model for food web manipulation that prioritizes biodiversity or has anyone looked into that? Um, as a priority rather than water quality or water um, clarity? Yeah, that's a really important um, issue to bring up. And so we do know spiny water flea do cause um, reduced growth rates in walleye and yellow perch um, when they're in that initial smaller stage. And so that does not promote um, biodiversity because it reduces their populations. Um, a lot of the biodiversity issues in Lake Mendota are a lot of the, the very small fish species that a lot of people haven't heard of, all kinds of darters and minnows and the small fish that frankly no one cares that much about or really knows about. Um, and so a lot of the biodiversity there, the issue is the habitat for them. You need um, the, the trees in the lake and you need complex habitat for these little fish to hide basically. And so as we've urban developed the lake, um, you know, people kind of, um, you know, kind of take care of their lake front. So they remove that tree and everything. Um, whereas we really need that complex habitat for those small fish. Um, and so a lot of what I've talked about is not directly related to the biodiversity of the lake, but a lot of that is mostly habitat related since we've urbanized the lake. Um, and John Lyons is a great person to talk to about that. Um, he's, he's the person for, for a lot of those little small fish. He knows a lot more about those. So if you want, you can reach out to him. It's another online question. Um, a lot of us may know the answer, but I think a lot of us don't. So it's always a good question to ask. Um, is it really unhealthy to swim, sail, et cetera, in Lake Mendota with algae? Or can people still do that? And I know there's specific times, but if you can just kind of maybe address that so everyone can hear. Yeah, so a great resource, obviously, the Clean Lakes Alliance. You guys all, you know, keep tabs on the lake and what's um, kind of the blooms. But yeah, you just want to keep tabs on this, particularly the harmful algal blooms, the blue greens. Um, those are kind of your, your biggest threat. Obviously, spiny water flea, you can swim with them, it's fine. Um, but the blue green algae is really what you want to be careful of. Um, they do have um, cystins and other toxins that they produce while. Um, they're growing in the lake. And so you just want to make sure you're avoiding when there's a lot of them. So right now you're totally fine, although it's cold. So probably don't want to go swim out there today, but um, there, you know, you're late July and August when there's uh, a lot of algal blooms. You just want to make sure you're keeping tabs on them from there. What's the status of the Cisco and what is that telling us about the, the lake? Yeah, status of the Cisco is rather interesting. So Cisco is a cold water, uh, a rather uh, silvery fish um, that in the 1980s was a, a very populous fish. Um, we have regular sampling, sampling on the lake that takes place every year. And through the 2000s, we had not seen a Cisco. 
Um, just last winter, I, I was, I keep the tabs on kind of the fishing forums, just as kind of just watching them and anglers were catching Cisco in Lake Mendota. Um, keep in mind, we have not seen one. I have the, the, the last Cisco is in our freezer um, from like 2007. Um, and all of a sudden we started seeing them caught out in Lake Mendota. And so we went out and we were able to get a couple ice anglers, give us a couple fish. And so it seems there was a, a, a new um, popular, or not new population, but a, a reproductive group of uh, fish of the Cisco that have, have showed up in Lake Mendota. Um, we then sampled through the summer. We also got them in our nets in the summer. And so it does seem that there's a new cohort of that cold water species in Lake Mendota, which is promising. Um, Cisco are, are a, a fish that are in decline throughout the entire state. Um, the last survey, we've lost about 30 to 40% of lakes that had Cisco in them um, throughout, the, throughout the state. And so it's, it's really promising to see them out there. Um, and something we're still really trying to understand and if I had a little bit more time as my PhD, I would be diving into that a little further, but it's very tempting. It's very interesting to see them come back. And, you know, you ask, you know, what are the genetics like of, of that population? You know, there only were a few individuals probably left and they put out this cohort. And so there's all kinds of questions that um, the Cisco story out of Mendota is very interesting to try and further understand. Looks like we have time for one more question. Um, I'm on... Uh, lake Monona, and we have a lot of PFAS in the lake. And is uh, the spiny water flea or any of the other discussions you've had impact or increase, decrease? How, how does it affect pollutants? I think pollutants. So the, the PFAS in Monona is largely coming from, you know, the there's the airport and the watershed. Um, and so the PFAS are largely, you know, fire retardants and that kind of thing. Um, and Dota is not as bad as far as the PFAS goes. Um, something we are, we have been interested in and researchers have been interested in is how spiny water flea impact the mercury cycle. Um, so mercury is cycling through the lake. We know that spiny water flea added a trophic position. Um, so another level of them eating something and something eating them. And we know that mercury bioaccumulates or increases incrementally as um, there's more and more uh, trophic positions. And so the mercury cycle has been sped up in Lake Mendota due to spiny water flea. Um, and so there's certain fish that we've kept tabs on as far as what are their mercury levels. Um, and that obviously has repercussions for consumption of the fish. Um, it is a complex issue, but um, at the end of the day, it, it has increased the mercury concentrations of particularly white bass. Um, those, those fish have increased in, in mercury. And so as far as PFAS, we haven't seen any connection, um, but mercury has been the one uh, contaminant that we are keeping tabs on and, and somewhat concerned about this invasion and, it, and its impact. All righty. Well, one more round of applause, please, for Ben. Again, thanks so much. This was a great presentation. Really interesting uh, topics. And again, we still have more questions, probably. So he'll be around if you want to loiter, talk to him after. Or uh, we will also take those questions that you might have if you want to send them virtually over email to info at cleanlakesalliance.org. Uh, we'll pass those along to you that way as well. So super cool, super interesting. Um, and again, always learning something new at these science cafes. So that is uh, nice to see as well. Um, so next month, May, we're off. Yes, taking a quick break. You might be saying, why? if we just started coming back in person. Well, the reason why is because instead of this event happening on May 18th, uh, there is going to be a community coffee and annual meeting uh, held also here at the Edgewater. Again, that's the 18th. And you can find more info on that event at cleanlakesalliance.com. And then June 8th, that's the next time we'll have another Science 101 or Clean Lakes 101 Science Cafe, uh, which will again be in person and virtual. Topic is TBD from what I understand. So stand by for that. And again, it's great having everyone back in person. Nice smiling faces, lots of good questions, and lots of interesting topics of conversation. So uh, enjoy. I believe we have the space for a little bit longer, still a little bit more food and coffee back there uh, if you want to enjoy on the way out. Again, I'm Max Zaparis, a meteorologist with WKOW, and we are happy to sponsor this event. So have a good day. <laughs>